Hi, and welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Gray. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, a prevalent issue in Simcoe County, Ontario, and across Canada. Please note that some of the content in today's show may be triggering for viewers as we will be dealing with subject matter related to trauma, violence, and exploitation. If you are looking for information and support related to human trafficking, please call the Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-833-900-1010. How does human trafficking impact precarious migrant workers? Well, in today's episode, I am joined by Yovana Blagovchanin, the anti-trafficking manager at the FCJ Refugee Center, who will be discussing this topic with me. Welcome, Yovana. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad that you can be here and to engage in this dialogue with me. Can you just share a little bit about who you are and um, maybe about your role as an anti-trafficking manager? Like, what does that mean? entail day to day. Yeah, Um, so I've been with FCJ Refugee Center for about two years um, as the anti-human trafficking manager for the last year. Um, And the program itself, we work with migrants who have either been exploited for labor or sex or they're at risk of exploitation. Uh, And so we work with migrants of all statuses and my role particularly is working, uh, I'm not so involved in the cases they Uh, day-to-day, but I am involved in giving orientations to migrant workers, information sessions about their rights, about what exploitation really looks like in Canada so they can recognize if their situation is exploitative, Um, and then also giving trainings to other organizations, other service providers that may not have that experience about with labor exploitation or migrants themselves. Um, And so then there's there's that part of it as well, but then also sitting on different committees. I'm the coordinator of the Toronto Counter Human Trafficking Network, and so that's an organiz- or a committee in Toronto uh, with over 30 organizations involved in it. Oh, incredible. Yeah, it is, it's, it's a great network, but it's only just one out of so many. It's a large network, but we're part of the Canadian Council for Refugees, where I sit on the committee, two committees there uh, with migrant workers and anti-human trafficking. And then there's also uh, the Collaborative Network to End Exploitation, a committee I sit on. Um, so several different uh, environments, I guess, with different stakeholders, different service providers, community members, where we are able to discuss the issues, discuss services, and work on campaigns and projects. Well, it sounds like, from what you're sharing, you have no shortage of work, and uh, you've highlighted you know, prevention education and sharing information about the realities of human trafficking with migrant workers, but then also just like how key collaboration is and connecting with different service providers and stakeholders to both prevent the issue from happening, but supporting those who are impacted by it. Now, some folks tuning into the show may be wondering, okay, well, what, what actually is human trafficking? And specifically, how does that impact migrant uh, workers or precarious migrant populations in Canada? Yeah, human trafficking is confusing for many. Um, They might have some sort of idea of it, but they don't really understand what it looks like in Canada. If you break it down, there is the act that could be the recruitment, the transferring, the harboring, the receipt of persons, and this can be done through fraud, coercion, deception, sometimes force, always for the purpose of exploitation, whether it's for labor, for sex, forced marriage, domestic servitude, or the removal of organs. But what that really looks like, especially when it comes to labor trafficking, the forced labor is where people get a little bit confused. Is how is someone forced into labor if they're not being physically forced? And so this can happen in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways that we see is that people are recruited from their country of origin, uh, usually by a third party. So some sort of recruiter, some sort of travel agency, sometimes a law, um, a law clinic, um, or a temporary job agency. So they may recruit from the country of origin to come work in Canada and they promise them a work permit, housing, a good job, maybe education, maybe able to bring your family here. And once they arrive here, they realize that it's not what was promised. And they've already paid a large sum of money to come because usually that what was promised them comes at a price. And so they've come to Canada with expectation of having a work permit, of having a good job, and they get here and they're living in overcrowded housing. Uh, paying high rent for that overcrowded housing, sometimes sharing beds with other workers, usually working in situations where they're working very long hours, maybe not in the job that they were promised, and usually not paid um, very well. If they're paid, there's deductions, sometimes they're paying off a debt to the person, the recruiter, or the travel agency, or the trafficker themselves. 
that was a really helpful and like in-depth explanation of kind of how trafficking can happen, what forced labor can look like. And I think that recruitment piece, right? Someone is being offered a false promise, a false opportunity, and really being deceived. Uh, because when they arrive here, like you said, it's, it's just not what they expected. What, when we talk about labor trafficking, you know, it's, it's not something, um, as you said, people really understand and are fully aware of. Where are some of the places that you're seeing labor trafficking take place? Um, and specifically, where are you seeing migrant workers being trafficked for labor? We see it in a lot of different kinds of um, sectors, I guess. There's always the agricultural work. Uh, so this could be with migrant workers who are here without a work permit or ones that came through one of the federal programs where they're being forced into work because they have employer-specific work permit and they have a very... Um, it's very challenging for them to be able to change that work permit, to be able to leave that employer. And so they feel forced. They feel like they have no other option, but instead of they must continue working for this employer and they have to accept the conditions of work. Um, for those that don't have a work permit, um, it could, again, this could happen in any sector for all migrants. It could happen in uh, hospitality. It can happen in... Um, in the cleaning industry and in service jobs like landscaping, roofing, uh, it can happen in restaurants and it can happen in factories. And um, I don't think that there's anywhere that is really safe from these kind, this kind of exploitation if it involves migrants without status, without work permits or with closed work permits. So it can really happen anywhere and everywhere is, is what you're highlighting. In terms of like geography and regions like is there an area where you see more of these these cases popping up or is it in both rural and urban areas like wh where are you seeing labor trafficking happening either you know in Ontario or beyond Ontario is definitely a hot spot for labor trafficking and human trafficking altogether um, we're definitely seeing it we've seen it in Toronto we've seen it in the York region we've seen it um, in Barrie Wasaga area um, and now we're also hearing that it's happening in places um, further up north in Thunder Bay area in the smaller communities there because they're seeing more migrants and so when there's migrants that don't have their work permits or have stable status then there's this power dynamic there's this um, this opportunity it, it leads them to vulnerable to exploitation because an employer can take advantage of that power dynamic where this migrant is dependent on their job and their income and so now they can take that uh, take advantage of that and exploit them and force them to work in conditions that um, they themselves would never work in that are difficult to continue working in and probably are hard to actually survive with can you describe like what are some of the conditions that you see people face and experience? Like just as someone's listening and, and trying to understand, right? So someone's potentially um, um, went to work on an ag at an agricultural location, thinking that they were doing something. Like w what makes it so that those those conditions are um, unlivable, but also difficult to leave? There may be. In situations, there may be uh, that they're working really long hours, so work uh, doing laborious work, really long hours with no breaks, uh, and they feel pressure to continue working because they're threatened. Either they're directly threatened, or their or their employer or their trafficker is making indirect threats, saying you know bragging about their wealth, about their power, about how they can get them deported. Uh, so then they fear that they've done something wrong and if they don't continue working for this person, they're going to be deported and they're going to suffer the consequences. In other cases, through um, the Temporary Foreign Worker Program or the Seasonal Program, uh, there may be conditions where they're working really long hours, they're being paid by, by piece, so about um, how many strawberries they can pick or um, in some cases for chicken catchers uh, the weight of the chickens that they're catching mm. and in that way they're forced to work at this rate that is very difficult and hard on their bodies because in order for them to be able to make income to support themselves and their families they need to work 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 no breaks uh, with horrible living conditions and unsanitary uh, and unsafe working conditions as well Oh my goodness. Um, I, I appreciate you kind of delving into just really the, 
It's awful. It's it's horrible. Um, and and I'm just yeah thinking about when you're saying how many strawberries can you pick, right? And just the power imbalances that are at play, where uh, people are in precarious situations and uh, they're being taken advantage of and exploited in horrific living circumstances and situations. What barriers do you see that um, migrant workers face in accessing support and services to be able to leave situations like that? Uh, one main thing is that they're not eligible for a lot of supports and services. Um, there is a lot of services for migrants in Canada are funded by immigration, so funded by IRCC, meaning that they can only support refugee claimants, refugees, permanent residents, and citizens. That leaves a lot of people out of those services, people that are out of status, people that are visitors, people that are temporary residents. Uh, and then the other hand, there are some programs that focus mainly on just temporary foreign workers and don't involve workers that aren't are here without a work permit or that are visitors. Um, and so there's limited ways that they can even access support, but then there's other challenges they may face. They may not know the language. They may be afraid to seek support. They may not trust authorities or other um, uh, law enforcement. They may not know where to go, that they have rights in Canada, uh, and they might be geographically uh, isolated either socially or from just where they live in rural and remote areas. Sounds like there's many barriers, and as you're sharing it, made me think of what you said at the beginning of our conversation, that some of the work that you're doing is actually prevention in terms of educating folks about their rights and about um, you know, what uh, living conditions should be like or where people can access support. So what supports and services do you offer to people and do you share with migrant workers who come through your door? So part of our programming is going into rural and remote areas and so we can go to where migrant workers are um, especially ones that aren't able to travel to our organization our center because we're located in toronto so we can go there and we can give them uh, information about their rights we can talk to them about what exploitation looks like about what an open work permit for vulnerable workers is uh, we can assess their case and see what options are available to them individually and then they also know that we're here because we can work with them remotely as well. So when we leave, they have our number and then they can talk to us and we can continue to support them while even when we're, you know, with, with, even with the distance apart. Well, thank you so much for the insights that you've shared and also just the incredible work that you're doing to um, engage in outreach and build relationships with folks in um, the, the migrant worker community to share resources and information and to create um, a safer and more equitable place for people to, to be and live in in Canada. Thank you so much for tuning into Freedom Fighters Code Grey. We are going to continue this conversation with Giovanna, the anti-human trafficking manager at the FCJ Refugee Center after we take this short break. Welcome back to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, a show where we discuss human trafficking. And in today's episode, we're specifically talking about the impact of trafficking on precarious migrant worker populations. And I'm joined by the anti-human trafficking manager, Yovana, at the FCJ Refugee Center. Yovana, as we just continue this conversation, someone may have missed part of the first segment of the show. So I'm just wondering if you could highlight again, you know, how does human trafficking impact uh, migrant worker communities? Yeah, uh, well, it imp impacts them in many, many different ways. There's those who come to Canada already with a promise of work, with a promise of work permit, and when they get here, it's not as promised, uh, and they feel forced to continue working because they don't have anywhere else to go. They spent money to come here, and maybe they're afraid. They're afraid for them or their family. In other ways, it impacts those that are already in Canada, uh, maybe as a visitor, and then they're recruited once in Canada to work. And again, the same, the same idea of false promises, deceit, and sometimes threats, indirect threats or direct threats. And then there's those that come here with a work permit but they're exploited through the programs that we do have in place, the, federal, uh, the Temporary Foreign Worker Program or the Seasonal Agriculture Worker Program, where they are tied to an employer with an employer-specific work permit and forced to accept the conditions of work because it's very challenging to change their work permit. 
So you've mentioned permits throughout our discussion quite a bit. And so I'm wondering if you could kind of unpack a little bit, like the difference between some of them and specifically the significance of an open work permit. Yeah. So an employer specific work permit is the one that would be issued to someone who's here seasonally or two years to three years with a contract. This uh, ties them to a work perm to an employer. And sometimes we call it a closed work permit too. Uh, because they can only work for one specific uh, employer in a specific role. And uh, they, so they can't just, if they don't like their employer, they don't like the work, uh, they feel like they're not being paid well enough, or they're facing abuse, they may have difficulties changing their employer because they're going to have to go through that whole uh, process again of finding a new employer that has a labor market impact assessment, um, then applying for a new work permit. And it's a challenging process. It's confusing. It's hard to navigate this immigration system. And it can be expensive because they may need to get a lawyer involved. Then there's an open work permit. This is given to um, s people in specific cases. So it could be a refugee claimant, somebody who's in the process of a permanent residency application. Um, and it allows them to work for any employer. Um, excluding some sorts of sex work involved. Um, but So they can't do escort services um, or work in massage parlors or I think there's specific rules that they of, that apply to them that don't allow them to engage in sex work, which is one issue in itself. But uh, with an open work permit, they can work for any other employer. And if they don't like the employer, they can leave that employer and they can work, find a new employer and work with them. And they don't have those limitations of being tied to one employer. You've just highlighted so clearly and articulately like these different permits and how they influence people. And, and, and in the first instance, you know how a particular permit may limit someone's ability to leap, essentially, even if they're subjected to abuse, violence, um, unequitable pay, or whatever it is. And so, you know, as someone if they are able to exit that situation, they may have experienced trauma of various kinds like, oh, and, and have various needs. Like, What are some of the support services that you think are needed to assist someone who is exiting these situations of labor trafficking? I think that it depends on the individual's needs. Uh, so one main issue is usually their immigration status. And so that's something that uh, our center usually tries to address is supporting them in finding some sort of at least temporary status so that they can stay in Canada and work in Canada. But then they might have other needs. They may have um, mental health. They may need counseling. They may need housing and usually need housing support. Uh, they may need a criminal lawyer. They may need to see actual an actual doctor. Um, they may need child care, there's many financial assistance. There's, it's really going to depend on the individual and their needs, if they're here with the family, if they're by themselves, and um, what kind of support systems they may have if they have friends or a community here. Um, there is the open work permit for vulnerable workers, which is a work permit that's available to someone who has a closed work permit, employer-specific work permit, and has faced abuse or is at risk of facing abuse in the workplace. And if they're approved, they have this open work permit for 12 months where they can work for any employer while they look for another employer that has a labor market impact assessment to get a closed work permit. So it's kind of like a transitional work permit. And the issue is that the worker themselves has to prove that they faced abuse or at risk of it. So that means they need evidence. They, they have to write their narrative about what's happened to them, and then they need proof of that. So if it's verbal abuse, if they have been yelled at, humiliated, you know, criticized often, um, threatened, all verbally, they have no proof. So it's very difficult to prove that you face something like that um, without, you know, if it's happened verbally. So it is. It can be a, a challenging solution, and it's also not a perfect solution either. On that front, I'm curious to know your thoughts around um, justice and around accountability for some of these workplaces, for lack of a better word, because they're not, because they're exploiting people. But these spaces and places in which are exploiting folks, how can they be held accountable? How can we advance justice for migrant workers from your perspective? I think that focusing on the employers or the bad players is not the right solution because it's a system that's broken. It's a flawed system that we have where migrants are left vulnerable to exploitation. 
because they don't have status or they don't have the ability to have a work permit or they don't have the ability to become a permanent resident. Uh, so they have very, they have limited rights. They don't know how to exercise those rights. So when we focus on the employers or the, the traffickers themselves, we're ignoring the broken system. So we need to address the broken system. The UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Modern Slavery visited Canada in August. And after meeting with us and other organizations and migrant workers themselves, he published a brief. He's um, a brief that is, I guess, before the major report. And in the brief, he had uh, said that the Temporary Foreign Worker Program is a breeding ground for contemporary forms of slavery. And he was disturbed by the injustices that migrant workers face here. And I think if people want to hold employers and traffickers accountable, we first need to hold the federal government accountable. And we need to address the system that's broken. And if and, and use this brief, this, this time right now is a perfect time to say, it's not just the migrant workers that are saying that they're going through this. Uh, we can we, we can see it. We can see we can see it in the work that we're doing. The UN Special Rapporteur listened to them and he heard he heard their stories as well. And he, he's also saying that there's an issue here in Canada that we need to fix this system. Earlier, you were talking about um, you know how people who are being trafficked for labor can be happening in spaces that you know we go to like restaurants or, or um, the hotels there, there could be people that folks in the general public and community may be interacting with mm -hmm. but then similarly um, you, you were just talking about the importance to advocate and uh, hold the government accountable to be able to change systems and norms that are really creating the grounds for exploitation in our society. What are some of the practical ways that someone tuning in could um, do something to either be a part of um, assisting the work of your team or also to be involved in changing some of these systems through reaching out to an MP, for example? Yeah. Uh, well, one main thing is obviously vote. Vote for governments that are going to put migrant workers' uh, rights at the forefront, but also getting involved in advocacy campaigns that are fighting for migrant rights. Um, there is, There has been this movement for status for all, where we're asking for migrant rights to have regularization programs available to them. And uh, the government has said that they're going to announce some sort of regularization program for some time now, and that hasn't happened yet. And I don't think, um, I, don't, I don't know when that's going to happen. But if people watching and people that are interested, they can join these kinds of movements. They can uh, support the voices of migrant workers to be heard, to be able to see this change and actually pressure the government to bring a regularization program and, and address the fact that we have this temporary foreign worker program that's a allowing employers to take advantage of migrant workers. Is there a link or a website or source that you would suggest where someone could get involved in a campaign like this? Yeah, um, we're involved with the Migrant Rights Network, so they do have a website where um, they have a lot of resources and ways to get, to get connected and they have many rallies. Um, our organization itself also has many resources available on our website that um, we have webinars, information sessions where they can, people can hear more about these situations. Um, and then also the Open Work Permit Now campaign. There's a website there. Um, I think it's just Open Work Permit Now. Um, and there you can see videos of migrant workers telling their story about how the closed work permit has um, led them to a situation where an uh, employer could exploit them and had legal means to exploit them. Now on the ground, um, the FCG, FCG, FCJ Refugee Center is supporting and working with individual people. So you're doing this great education awareness work, this excellent advocacy work, but you're also helping real human beings who have been impacted by exploitation in our communities. Is there a story that you can share of someone who has experienced labor trafficking and shed light on how did your organization come alongside that person to support them in their journey? Yeah, um, so we do support um, individuals or we also support uh, groups of people that might have experienced labor trafficking in these larger cases. 
Um, recently, there has been a case where we, um, there was a group of migrant workers who were recruited from their country of origin to work here under false promises again. Um, and once they got here, they were told that they owed money for the job, for transportation, for rent, for food, for um, pillows and, and sheets. And they said, don't worry, you're going to make so much money here, you'll pay it off. So they were working to pay off this debt. And um, they continued working with uh, deductions made all the time, where they were left with a few hundred dollars, which is obviously not a lot to survive in Canada. It's, it's nearly impossible. And uh, we were we were connected with this case through police because they have they were investigating and they called us because there is a um, a lack of supports and services for labor trafficking victims, and so they called us and we met with all of the survivors, and we met with them and addressed their needs, addressed their immigration concerns, supported them with the uh, temporary resident permit applications. Uh, and uh, connected them to clothing banks and doctors and all of the needs that they may have. Uh, and they were able to receive temporary resident permits. But the issue um, is, and this highlights a really big issue as well um, in the system, is that they were issued these temporary resident permits for a short term. And because the case was concluded in the courts, uh, the trafficker pleaded guilty, everything was done, uh, the government, uh, immigration, didn't really need them anymore in Canada. And so after that, they didn't have, they were refused for the temporary resident permits when we tried to apply again. And now they're either out of status in Canada, uh, considering refugee claims, or returning back to their country of origin. Oh my goodness. I am heartbroken by the end of that story. Like you were sharing how you're able to come alongside and, and help these folks, but then there's still so many gaps that need to be addressed. But I'm grateful that you have been a part of this dialogue today to really address the complexities, but also the difficult nature of addressing the issue of labor trafficking. There's so much work that needs to be done. And so hopefully people tuning into the show can get involved and participate in the great work that you and your team are doing. If you are tuning into our show today and you are in need of information and support related to human trafficking in Canada, please call 1-833-900-1010. If you're in a situation of immediate danger and it's safe and you have access to do so, please call 911. Today I've been joined by Yovana from the FCJ Refugee Center who has been talking about the impact of human trafficking on migrant worker populations. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Freedom Fighters Code Grey and we hope to catch you next time. Mm -hmm.